Greetings to all. Welcome to all of you. Today I start a new series of Bible study and we're going to study the Gospel of Mark. We ended a couple of days ago the New Testament commentary on the Gospel of Matthew and as I promised to start another on another Gospel. And Mark was the first Gospel before the other Gospels were written. This is Reverend Yeti. Welcome and I hope we can enjoy together this new study. God's servant is here, and we are in Mark 1. The gospel is neither a discussion nor a debate. It's an announcement. Mark wasted no time giving that announcement, for it is found in the opening words of his book. Matthew, who wrote primarily for the Jews, opened his book with a genealogy. And after all, he had to prove to his readers that Jesus Christ is indeed the rightful heir to David's throne. Since Luke focused mainly on the sympathetic ministry of the Son of Man, he devoted the early chapters of his book to a record of the Savior's birth. Luke emphasized Christ's humanity for he knew that his Greek readers would identify with a perfect babe who grew up to the perfect man. John's Gospel begins with a statement about eternity. Why? Because John wrote to prove to the whole world that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. John 20, verse 31. The subject of John's Gospel is the deity of Christ. But the object of his Gospel is to encourage his readers to believe on the Savior and receive the gift of eternal life. Where does Mark's Gospel fit in? Mark wrote for the Romans, and his theme is Jesus Christ, the servant. If we had to pick a key verse in this gospel, it would be Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life and ransom for many. The fact that Mark wrote with the Romans in mind helps us understand his style and approach. The emphasis in this gospel is on activity. Mark describes Jesus as his busy list, I mean, busy line moves from place to place and meets the physical and spiritual needs of all kinds of people. One of Mark's favorite words is straightway meaning immediately. He uses it 41 times, and Mark does not record many of our Lord's sermons because his emphasis is on what Jesus did rather than what Jesus said. He reveals Jesus as God's servant, sent to minister to suffering people and to die for the sins of the world. Mark gives us no account of our Lord's birth, nor does he record a genealogy unnecessary in regard to a servant. In this opening chapter, Mark shares three important facts about God's servant. The first one, the servant's identity, and we are in Mark 1. How does Mark identify this servant? 
He records the testimonies of several dependable witnesses to assure us that Jesus is all that he claims to be. John Mark, the author of the book, is the first witness. He states boldly that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It is likely that Mark was an eyewitness of some of the events that he wrote about, but there may be other discussions or debates or theological um, insights on that, but we're not going to go in there. I just want to give you a decent Bible study that you can use in your life and to understand more about the Gospels. He lived in Jerusalem with his mother, Mary, and their home was a meeting place for believers in the city. Acts 12, the verses 1 to 19. Several scholars believe that Mark was a young man described in Mark 14, verses 51 to 52, since Peter called Mark my son, 1 Peter 5, 13. But as we know also, in the New Testament, Paul also talks about a son. And historical has been found that Paul should have adopted Timothy. I'm not sure about this, but we can always um, study that more in depth. could be Timothy, it could also be another son. So this could also be the same as it is for Peter, why he calls my son. It is probably that it was Peter who led Mark to faith in Jesus Christ, and church tradition states that Mark was Peter's interpreter, so that the Gospel of Mark reflects the personal experiences and witnesses of Simon Peter. The word gospel simply means the good news. To the Romans, Mark's special target audience gospel meant joyful news about the emperor. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news that God's son has come into the world and died for our sins. It is the good news that our sins can be forgiven, that we can belong to the family of God and one day go to live with God in heaven. It is the announcement of victory over sin, death, and hell. The second witness is that of the prophets, verses 2 to 3. Mark cited two quotations from the Old Testament prophets, Malachi 3, verse 1, and Isaiah 40, verse 3. Note also Exodus 23, verse 20, and that's the Old Testament. The words messenger and voice refer to John the Baptist, the prophet God sent to prepare the way for his son. In ancient times, before a king visited any part of his realm, a messenger was sent before him to prepare the way. This included both repairing the roads and preparing the people. By calling the nation to repentance, John the Baptist prepared the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah and Malachi joined voices and declaring that Jesus Christ is the Lord, Jehovah, God. John the Baptist is the next witness, verses 4 to 8. Jesus called him the greater of the prophets, Matthew 11, verses 1 to 15. In his dress, manner of life, and message of repentance, John identified with Elijah, 2 Kings, verses uh, chapter 1, verse 8, and Malachi, chapter 4, verse 5, Matthew 17, verses 10 to 13, and note Luke, chapter 1, verses 13 to 17. The wilderness where John ministered is the rugged wasteland along the western shore of the Dead Sea. John was telling the people symbolically that they were in a spiritual wilderness, far worse than the physical wilderness that their ancestors had endured for 40 years. 
John called the people to leave their spiritual wilderness, trust their Joshua, Jesus, and enter into their inheritance. John was carefully to magnify Jesus and not himself. See John 3, verses 25 to 30. John would baptize repentant sinners in water, but the coming one would baptize them with the Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 5. This did not mean that John's baptism was unauthorized. See Matthew 21, verses 23 to 27. Or that water baptism would one day be replaced by spirit baptism. See Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20. Rather, John's message and baptism were preparations so that the people would be ready to meet and trust the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Our Lord's apostles were no doubt baptized by John. See John 4, verses 1 to 2, and Acts chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. The Father and the Holy Spirit are Mark's final witnesses to the identity of God's servant, verses 9 to 11. When Jesus was baptized, the Spirit came on him as a dove, and the Father spoke from heaven and identified his beloved Son. The people who were there did not hear the voice or see the dove, but Jesus and John did. The world The word beloved not only declared affection, but it also carried the meaning of the only one. The Father's announcement from heaven reminds us of Psalm 2, verse 7, and Isaiah 42, verse 1. You will want to note these references in Mark's Gospel to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Mark 1, verse 1. And verse 11, chapter 3, verse 11, chapter 5, verse 7, chapter 9, verse 7, chapter 12, verse 1 to 11, chapter 13, verse 32, chapter 14, verses 61 to 62, and chapter 15, verse 39. Mark did not write his book about just any Jewish servant. He wrote his book about the very Son of God who came from heaven to die from the sins of the world. Jesus, yes, Jesus is a servant, but he is a most unusual servant. And after all, it is a servant who prepares the way for others and announces their arrival. But others prepared the way for Jesus and announced that he had come. Even heaven itself took note of him. The servant is the Son of God. Second, the servant's authority. Still in chapter 1, okay? We expect a servant to be under authority and to take orders. But God's servant exercises authority and gives orders, even to demons, and his orders are obeyed. In this section, Mark describes three scenes that reveal our Lord's authority and the servant of God. First, His redemption, verses 12 and 13. Mark does not give us full an account of the temptation as to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11, and Luke chapter 4, verse 1 to 13. But Mark adds some vivid details that the others omit. The Spirit divided him into the wilderness. Mark uses strong word 11 times, to describe the casting out of demons. It does not suggest that our Lord was either unwilling or afraid to face Satan. Rather, it's Mark's way of showing the intensity or the in- intensity of the experience. No time was spent basking in the glory of the heavenly voice, or the presence of the heavenly dove. The servant had a task to perform, and he immediately went to do it. In concise form, Mark presents us with two symbolic pictures. 
Our Lord's 40 days in the wilderness reminds us of Israel's 40 years in the wilderness. Israel failed when they were tested, but our Lord succeeded victoriously, having triumphed over the enemy. Jesus could now go forth and call a new people who would enter into their spiritual inheritance. Since the name Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua, we can see the, par- we can see the parallel. The second picture is that of the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45 The first Adam was tested in a beautiful garden and failed, but Jesus was tempted in a dangerous wilderness and won the victory. Adam lost his dominion over creation because of his sin, but in Christ that dominion has been restored for all who trust him. Hebrews 2 verses 6 to 8. Jesus was with the wild beasts and they did not harm him. He gave a demonstration of that future time of peace and righteousness when the Lord shall return and establish his kingdom. Isaiah 11 verse 9 and Isaiah 35 verse 9. Indeed, he is a servant with authority. Second, his preaching verses 14 to 22. If ever a man spoke God's truth with authority, it was Jesus Christ. It has been said that the scribe spoke from authorities, but that Jesus spoke with authority. Mark was not recording as the beginning of our Lord's ministry, since he had already ministered in other places. He is telling us why Jesus left Judea and came to Galilee. Herod had arrested John the Baptist and wisdom dictated that Jesus relocate. By the way, it was during this journey that Jesus talked with the Samaritan woman. John 4, verses 1 to 45. Our Lord's message was the gospel of the kingdom of God, or the gospel of God, as some texts read. No doubt most of the Jews read political revolution into the phrase kingdom of God. But that was not what Jesus had in mind at all. His kingdom has to do with his reign in the lives of his people. It is a spiritual realm and not a political organization. The only way to enter God's kingdom is by believing the good news and being born again. The gospel is called the gospel of God because it comes from God and brings us to God. It is the gospel of the kingdom because faith in the Savior brings you into his kingdom. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ because he is the heart of it. Without his life, death, and resurrection, there would be no good news. Paul called it the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, verse 24, because there can be no salvation apart from grace, Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9. There is only one gospel, Galatians 1, verses 1 to 9, and it centers in what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 11. Jesus preached that people should repent, change their mind, and believe. See Acts 20, verse 21. Repentance alone is not enough to save us. Even though God expects believers to turn from their sins, we must also put positive faith in Jesus Christ and believe His promises of salvation. Repentance without faith could become remorse, and remorse can destroy people who carry a burden of guilt. Because Jesus preached with authority, He was able to call men from their regular occupations and make them his disciples. Who else could interrupt four fishermen at their work and challenge them to leave their nets and follow him? Several months before Jesus had already met Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and they had come to trust him, see John 1 verses 35 to 49, this was not their initial call to faith and salvation. It was an initial call to discipleship. 
The fact that Zebedee had hired servants suggested that his fishing business was successful and that he was a man of means. It is also assures us that James and John did not mistreat their father when they heeded Christ's call. With the help of his servants, Zebedee could still manage the business. Jesus did not invent the term fishers of men. In that day, it was a common description of philosophers and other teachers who captured man's mind through teaching and persuasions. They would bait the hook with their teachings and catch disciples. It is likely that as many as seven of our Lord's disciples were fishermen. John 21 verse 1 to 3. Surely the good qualities of successful fishermen would make for success in the difficult ministry of winning lost souls. I mean, sorry, winning lost souls. Courage, the ability to work together, patience, energy, stamina, faith, and tenacity. Professional fishermen simply could not afford to be quitters or complainers. Just ministered not only in the open air, but also in the synagogue. The Jewish synagogues developed during the nation's exile when the people were in Babylon after the temple had been destroyed. Wherever there was ten Jews, men above the age of twelve, a synagogue could be organized. The synagogue was not a place of sacrifice, that was done at the temple, but of reading the scriptures, praying, and worshiping God. The services were led not by priests, but by laymen, and the ministry was su- supervised by a board of elders that was presided over by a ruler. Mark 5.22 It was customary to ask visiting rabbis to read the, sp- the scriptures and teach which explains why Jesus had such freedom to minister in the synagogues. The Apostle Paul also took advantage of this privilege. Acts 13, verses 14 to 16. Our Lord had set up his headquarters in Capernaum, possibly in or near the home of Peter and Andrew. You may see the remains of a Capernaum synagogue when you visit the Holy Land today but it is not one in which Jesus worshipped. The people assembled for services on the Sabbath as well as on Mondays and Thursdays. Being a faithful Jew, Jesus honored the Sabbath by going to the synagogue, and when he thought the word, the people were astonished at his authority. He will discover, I mean you will discover as you read, read Mark's gospel that he delights in recording the emotional responses of people. The congregation in the synagogue was astonished and his teaching and is was amazed. At his healing powers, Mark 1 27, also note chapter 2 verse 12, chapter 5 verse 20, and so on. You even find Mark recording our Lord's amazement of the unbelief of the people in Nazareth. There is certainly nothing monotonous about these narratives. 3. His Commands, verses 23-28 We wonder how many synagogue serves that man had attended with revealing what he was demonized. It took the presence of the Son of God to expose the demon, and Jesus not only exposed him, but he also commanded him to keep quiet about his identity and to depart from the man. The Savior did not want, nor did he need, the assistance of Satan and his army to tell people who uh, he was. The demon certainly knew exactly who Jesus was and that he had nothing in common with him. Act 19, the verses 13 to 17. The demon's use of plural pronouns shows how closely he was identified with the man through whom he was speaking. The demon clearly identified Christ's humanity, Jesus of Nazareth, as well as his deity, the Holy One 
of God. He also confessed great fear that Jesus might judge him and send him to the pit. There are people today just like this demonized man in a religious meeting able to tell who Jesus is and even trembling with fear of judgment. Yet lost, see James chapter 2 verse 19. Hold thy peace literally means be muzzled. Jesus would use the same words when stilling the storm. Mark 4:39. The demon tried one last convulsive attack, but I mean attack, but then had to submit to the authority of God's servant and come out of the man. The people in the synagogue were amazed and afraid. They realized that something new had appeared on the scene, a new doctrine and a new power. Our Lord's words and works must always go together. The people kept on talking about both, and the fame of Jesus began to spread. Our Lord did not encourage this kind of public excitement, lest it creates problems with both the Jews and the Romans. The Jews would want to follow him only because of his power to heal them. And the Romans would think he was a Jewish in surrealistic trying to overthrow the government. This explains why Jesus so often told people to keep quiet. The fact that they did not obey created problems for him. Three, the servant, the servant's sympathy. Two miracles of healing are described in this section, both of which reveals, and this is chapter 1, but the first is out 29 to 45. So, um, it reveals the compassion of the Savior for those in need. In fact, so great was his love for the needy that the, the Savior ministered to great crowds of people after the Sabbath had ended. When it was lawful for them to come for help, it would appear that God's servant was at the back and call of all kinds of people, including demoniacs and lepers, and he, and he lovingly ministered to them all. Jesus and the four disciples left the synagogue and went to Peter and Andrew's house for their Sabbath meal. Perhaps Peter was a bit apologetic because his wife had to care for her sick mother and was unable to entertain them in the usual manner. We do not know about the other disciples, but we do know that Peter was a married man. Peter and Andrew not only brought their friends James and John home with them from the service, but they also brought the Lord's home. That is a good example for us to follow. Don't leave Jesus at the church. Take him home with you and let him share your blessings and your burdens. What a privilege it was for Peter and his family to have the very Son of God as a guest in their humble home. Before long, the guest became the host, just as one day the passenger in Peter's boat would become the captain. By faith, the man told Jesus about the sick woman, no doubt expecting him to heal her. That is exactly what he did. The fever left her immediately, and she was able to go to the kitchen and serve the Sabbath meal. If you have ever had a bath, bad fever, and you know how painful and uncomfortable it is. You also know that after the fever leaves, after the fever leaves you, it takes time for you to regain your strength. But not so in this case. She was able to serve the Lord immediately. And isn't service to our Lord one of the best ways to thank Him for all He has done for us? What was the result of this miracle? When the Sabbath ended at sundown, the whole city showed up at Peter's door. They brought their sick and afflicted, and the Lord, who was no doubt weary, healed them all. The Greek verb indicates that they kept on bringing people to him so that he must have gone to sleep at a very late hour. Note in Mark 1.32 
the clear distinction made between the diseased and the demonized. While Satan can cause physical affliction, not all sickness is caused by demonic power. Late hours did not keep Jesus from his appointed meeting with his father early the next morning. Read Isaiah 50, verse 4, for a prophetic description of God's righteous servant as he meets the Father morning by morning. What an example for us to follow. It is no surprise that Jesus had such authority and power when his prayer life was so disciplined. However, the crowds wanted to see Jesus again, not to hear his word, but to experience his healing and see him perform miracles. Peter was surprised that Jesus did not hasten to meet the crowds, but instead left for other towns where he might preach the gospel. Peter did not realize the shallowness of the crowds, their unbelief, and their lack of appetite for the word of God. Jesus said it was more important for them to preach the gospel in other places than to stay there and heal the sick. He did not permit popular acclaim to change his priorities. Perhaps we can understand our Lord's concern for a feverish a feverish woman, but that he would meet and touch a leper is somewhat beyond our understanding. Lepers were supposed to keep their distance and warn everyone that they were coming, lest others would be defiled. This man knew that Jesus was able to heal him but he was not sure the Master was willing to heal him. Lost sinners today have the same unnecessary concern, for God has made it abundantly clear that he is not willing that sinners perish, and that he is willing that all men, all people, be saved. Jesus had compassion on the man <coughs> and healed him. He did it with his touch and with his word. No doubt this was the first loving touch this leper had felt in a long time. As with the fever, so with the leprosy, it was gone instantly. For reasons already stated, Jesus commanded the man not to tell everybody he was to go to the priest's and followed the instructions given in Leviticus 14, so that he might be declared clean and received back into the social and religious life of the community. However, the man disobeyed orders. Jesus told this man to keep quiet, and yet he told everybody. Jesus commands us to tell everybody, and we keep quiet. The crowds that came to get help, help from Jesus created a serious problem for him and probably hindered him from teaching the word as he intended to. The sermon he described in Leviticus 14 presents a beautiful picture in type of work of redemption. The two birds represent two different aspects of our Lord's ministry, his incarnation and death, the bird put into the jar, and then killed, and his resurrection and ascension, the bird stained with the blood and then set free. The blood was applied to the man's right ear, God's word, right thumb, God's work, and right grade two, God's walk. Then the oil was put on the blood, symbolizing the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit cannot come on human flesh until first the blood has been applied. We should learn some important spiritual lessons from this chapter to begin with. If the Son of God came as a servant, then being a servant is the highest of all callings. We are never more like the Lord Jesus than when we are serving others. Second, God shares his authority with the servants. Only those who are under authority have the right to exercise authority. And finally, if you are going to be a servant, be sure you have compassion because people will come to you for help and rarely ask 
if it is convenient. Yes, what a a privilege it is to follow in the steps of Jesus Christ and meet the needs of others by being one of God's compassionate servants. So this is the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And let me give you some questions. So what about Jesus' life shows you his servant spirit? When Jesus healed the people around him of their illness, what did they learn of his servanthood? How is this important to us? What role does companion Compassion play in the servanthood. So, this is our first one. It's a long one, but take your time to go over it again. And read the Gospel of Mark. It will help you. Also, I advise you to read also the scriptures that I gave you. I know it's a lot, but it doesn't have to be done today. Take your time. It's important to go in-depth. It's not important to rush. So, I wish you a all a blessed day wherever you are and also a blessed weekend. Have a great time. Blessings to all of you. Bye.